Okay, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 1 this morning. As you know, in the book of Acts, we came to chapter 9 and Paul's conversion. And we wanted to take a little side step here and take a look at what, how Paul describes his, uh, his coming to Christ uh, and how he uses that. Now, uh, understand that Paul's letters are written to specific churches for specific reasons. All right, he just doesn't write nearly little letters. Oh, I'm going to write Galatia today and see how they're doing. No, there's a problem at Galatia Paul is addressing. All of his other letters are the same way. Even Book of Romans is dealing with an issue uh, that, that they're struggling with, they're uh, confronting with. <coughs> we don't know exactly what's going on in Galatia. We know there's some teaching there that's anti-Christ. And uh, Paul's addressing that. We don't know what the issue is specifically. The Galatians know and Paul knows. So he's not going to repeat that in their letter because he's writing to them. He's not writing to us. Now, in that case, if Paul is writing to a specific church for a specific reading, what do we get out of it? Some 2,000 years later, what do we get out of Galatians or any other Bible book that wasn't written to us? What do we take away from it? How do we apply it to our lives? Well, one of the ways is that uh, we have to be careful that we don't say well, what Paul says to the Galatians means it says for us. Whenever we interpret scripture, whatever book we're in, uh, whatever letter we're studying, uh, we also want to find it's the principles and it's the values that we find here that we apply. Now, what's the difference between a principle and a value? A principle is etched in stone. Love the Lord your God with all your mind and soul and your neighbor as yourself, etched in stone. A value is how we interpret that in our lives. How do we love God? In what way? How do we love our neighbor? And in what way? Those are values that are set that come out of the principles. So in these books and letters, we want to look for the principle here and then see how that's a value. All right? There's a principle involved in Galatia that's not involved anywhere else. Paul's letter to the Galatians is a admonishment more than instruction. Paul does not begin with his usual, oh, I hear you do this, you do great work. He gets right to the point. And when he uses his language, it's, a, it's, it's confrontational. There is an issue at Galatia that's, that is going to cause them to break away from the kingdom of God. More importantly, break away from the grace that they find in Jesus Christ. We don't know what that teaching is that they're doing. We can only piece together. One of the ways that I look at this, Paul is going to use his example as to the rest of the letter. If we understand Paul's use of his example, we understand the issues that are at stake. And so Paul begins in verse 1, chapter 1, Paul an apostle. Now what is an apostle? Anybody can tell me what an apostle is? A messenger. A messenger, okay. What else? He was, they were with Christ from the beginning, pretty much, except for Paul. Yes. Okay, so they were with Christ. They're an ambassador. They speak for Christ. What's interesting about Paul, and what I find about Paul, is Paul preaches and writes and teaches prophetically. That is, he's calling his people to repentance always. All right? Uh, he's not calling them to perfection in terms of being perfect, but in perfection toward being growing in Christ. So he has a prof, uh, what I call a prophetic uh, uh, si uh, symbol, style to him. Uh, that's something I did in my preaching. In my preaching, I always took on the role of a, of a prophet. Uh, not prophet in predicting things are going to happen. That's not the type a biblical prophet is. A uh, prophet was to call people into repentance. Uh, uh, and so that's kind of what we want to do. Paul, an apostle, speaks for God, for Jesus. Now, he differentiates that by saying, not from men, 
nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me. So, we learn a couple things about his apostleship and about this letter. His apostleship does not come from men. It was not assigned this by Peter. Uh, John didn't tell him to go do this. Uh, it was through Jesus Christ. He received that message from Jesus Christ. Now notice this. This is something interesting about Paul's letters. He will talk about Jesus Christ, but when he talks about God, he talks about the Father. So whenever you see the word God in Paul's writings, he's talking about the Father. He will differentiate between God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, the Son of the God. Okay? Uh, I think there's reasons for that. Um, some of my colleagues don't like this, but uh, he's preaching to a Gentile audience. What is the Gentiles? How do they worship? They worship gods. And so if he came out and said, Jesus is a god, what's he doing? He's actually talking about many gods. And so he's very careful about talking about Jesus Christ in relation to the Father. All right? That's why in Acts, we'll see in Acts, when he talks about Jesus, he will talk about the man, Jesus. All right? He wants to differentiate. He's very careful not to give this polytheology, uh, but uh, wants, uh, wants to know that God is just one. Okay? Uh, to the churches of Galatia. And he begins here in verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom the glory forever and ever. Amen. More than likely, this is a word of a prayer. Uh, Paul does this sometimes. He'll break into a prayer. This is probably his opening prayer. Uh, grace, as I said, whenever you see the word grace, 99% of the time you want to insert the word love. It's an active love. It's not a passive love. So with God, this active love, this grace, is meant to do something to us or for us. Uh, and in this case, again, he mentions God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and he gave himself up for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. He explains. Now, this is a key to understanding what Paul's going to get at in his letter. All right? Uh, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for our sins to deliver us from this evil age. Keep that in mind. As you read the rest of Galatians, it's all about that. It's all about Jesus and what he's done for them, accordingly to the will of God, our Father. All right? To the will of God. Jesus is in the will of God. All right? Giving up his sins and dying on the cross, giving up his sins of resurrection, it's all because of the will of God. God has set this in motion. All right? To him be the glory forever and ever. When you see, ever see the word glory, remember that 99% of the time, another word for glory is honor. All right? That's something we don't understand in our culture. But to whom be the honor forever and ever. And of course, God is honorable in that he does what he says he's going to do. All right? And his grace is honorable. Uh, Jesus is honored because he goes and he's obedient to God. We are honored when we are obedient to God. God is honored when he's faithful to us. All right? Let me go for it. And now he gets to the point. I am astonished. That word in the Greek can mean, I am perplexed. I don't know what's going on. I am surprised what you're doing, that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Bingo. He gets right to the point. Doesn't mess around. He's not going to give any fluff. He's going to get right to the point. He's astonished you are so quickly deserting him. Uh, deserting who? Who's the him he's talking about? Who called you in the grace of Christ? God. All right, God's behind this. Who called you? Now, the word call, you may have the word chosen in your, in your uh, uh, translation. The word called or chosen 
isn't an individual calling or individual being chosen. It means that you are special people of God. So whenever you see the word called or chosen, it means that you are part of a special group of people, of God's people. All right? So you have been made a part of the family of God All right? uh, in the grace of Christ. Uh, uh, called in the grace of Christ, meaning, again, the love of Christ, what Christ does for you as love. And I want to emph- uh, make this clear that he does this as a king, all right? Uh, he doesn't do this as a human sacrifice. He does this as being a lawful and loyal and faithful king. And we studied that in Second Chronicles, that because he's a faithful king, he can go in front of the Father and say, you need to forgive them their sins. All right? Uh, and he goes in, he's advocate for us because he was faithful on earth as a king. He's able to do that. And that's important for us to note. So there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. We don't know what that teaching is. And I want to be very careful about this. We're talking about a distortion of the gospel that is specific and uh, dangerous. It's not like uh, 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 one group gospel, Baptist gospel versus Church of Christ gospel or Methodist gospel. It's not that type of gospel. It is about denying Christ. All right? It's very specific and to the point. It's not about denominations. I know sometimes we may use it this way, but it's not. They are distorting a gospel of Christ. Uh, and he goes on, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. All right, all right. It, that doesn't mean that there's going to be an angel. All right, he's just using this uh, as a, as example, and he includes himself. If we, meaning the apostles, if we or an angel from him should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. This is very important. <clears throat> All right. He writes this at a time when the Bible was not there. There is no New Testament yet. It hasn't been put together. It's going to be another four centuries before it's finally put together. All right. So this is a period that we call oral transmission or oral. Everything is done orally. The Word of God is being preached orally. Uh, it, the stories are being done orally. And so there's an oral translation uh, going on. Also understand at this time, uh, the k- Christian movement is still tied to the Jewish faith. So they see it as another sect of Judaism. All right? Um, so they see it as another sect. That means uh, they don't know what to do with these new converts, these Gentile converts. What do we do? What do we do in the Jewish faith? Well, we proselytize them. We had them circumcised. We had them obey the world's laws of God, the laws of Moses, which was very natural for them to do that. All right? Because that's all they know. All right? This is something new. And so I'm not trying to defend this. I'm just trying to get us to understand where it's coming from. And these are very, I want us to understand, these are very sincere people uh, who are who are listening to this. We don't know the sincerity of those who are preaching or teaching it, but we know that the Galatians are sincere and they want to serve God. All right? Um, If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. Uh, Do you think that's a Christian attitude? To accurse someone? Well, he's not cursing them, is he? He's saying, God. So it's okay for us to ask God to accurse somebody? It's okay to what? Ask God to accurse somebody? Sure. We have, a, we have a value here is what I'm saying. Now, how do we apply that value? Well, I remember once, uh, I may have told the story, I'm not sure. I was going to one of my classes in Memphis, and I inadvertently kept my uh, laptop in my check-in baggage. Well, when I got to Memphis, it was gone. Someone had stolen my laptop, along with all my notes, along with all my classwork, and everything else, all my research, everything. 
So the first day of Bible, uh, the first day of class, the professor asked, okay, any prayer requests? And I raised my hand and I said, someone stole my laptop and I want him to get AIDS or something terrible. <laughs> I want him to be, I want him to be accursed. And of course the class was like, oh, no. You know, and, and the professor goes, no, but we'll pray for that. Maybe through this he might be converted. I'm going, that's not what I want. <laughs> but do you see how this idea of Christian values can be interpreted in our lives? Even to the point of asking God to do something that we know we shouldn't do. I was not going to go out there and give him AIDS or I was going to chop his hands off. That was God's feeling. But that was my feeling at the time. And we see that in Psalms, there are those Psalms that talk about taking care of God's enemies. Uh, so uh, again, uh, just because he's asking for the accursement does not necessarily mean that is a non-Christian thing to do. All right? Otherwise, Paul wouldn't do it. All right? That's how serious the situation is. Again, this is a serious situation in Galatians. We cannot... Uh, Neglect that. We cannot brush it aside. Something's going on. Beginning in verse 11, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me, the gospel that was preached by me, is not man's gospel. It didn't come from man. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This sets Paul apart. His apostleship comes from Christ. His gospel comes from Jesus Christ. All right? doesn't come from man. Peter didn't take him aside and say, okay, here's the gospel you need to preach. Uh, in fact, you need to do that. No. It comes from Jesus. We know that after Paul gets uh, baptized and, and his, uh, gets his sight back, he goes into the desert. And I forget how long. I think three years or four years. I don't know. He's in the desert for some time. Then he goes back to Tarsus, and he preaches and teaches the gospel there in the synagogues, I think for 10 years before he comes down to Antioch. All right? So during that time he's in the wilderness or in the desert, he has to rethink everything he's learned from the Old Testament. All right? He has to relearn the prophecies. He has to relearn how to interpret that. So he has to learn what are the principles and what are the values. Principles will never change. Values will change with the times. All right? Values will change with the times. Principles will not change. All right? Uh, how we love God uh, will change. Uh, how we love our neighbor will change depending on our culture, depending on our uh, society, depending on who we are. And so we need to remember that. So when we want to get back to the Bible. We want to make sure we're getting back to the principles, not just the values. All right? So we want to get back to the principles. And there's a principle here. And the principle is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Uh, and what does that mean in our life? So the values are coming out. What does it mean that Jesus died for our sins? Uh, what does that mean? And so Paul is going to explain that. For I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it but received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And now he's going to talk about his own personal experience. This is a window, not only in the situation that's going on in Corinth, I mean in Galatia, but a, it's a window in understanding Paul, understanding why he writes what he writes, understanding that he's applying his life, example, to the situation in Galatia. So we're going to see different things in his his. Uh, uh, experience in Galatia than we saw in 1 Corinthians because he's writing to a different audience. And so it's the same principle. However, he is saying it differently to make his point. All right? uh, you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing Judaism beyond my many of my own age among my people. So extremely jealous was I for the traditions of my father. All right? Opening side, he's violently opposed. What does this signal about what the problem is? 
that he's facing in Galatia. Why would he even talk about this? What's his point he's getting to? It may be. Doesn't he identify with what they're doing? I mean, because he used to be the same one. Yes, yes, that's a very good point. He's identifying himself. He is actually putting himself up as, a, as an example, putting himself up as a pedestal, as, so to speak. Look at my example. And his example was being a Jew amongst Jews, a Pharisee amongst Pharisees. We'll hear that later on. All right? So his example, and I have not fallen away. All right? That's his point. So we understand that what's going on here in Galatia, and the, the gospel is being distorted, has something to do with Judaism, has something to do with the traditions of the fathers. All right? That's what's going on here. And Paul is saying, and then he goes, but. Now, whenever you see the word but, that is a dramatic but. Okay? That's not just conversational stuff. He's talking about, you need to stop and take notice of this. But. So he's going to change course. Uh, but when he who had set me apart before I was born, and he who called me by his grace was to be pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him amongst the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anybody, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles. All right, he was set apart before he was born. <coughs> the providence of God. We know there are examples of this. Uh, uh, he was called uh, by his grace, uh, revealed uh, in part before he was even born. God was planning for Paul to do this all the time. All right? Now, what he's saying is, even though I was called to do this, I chose to do this negative stuff. He didn't understand his calling until afterwards. All right? But he knew he was zealous for the Jewish faith, Jewish traditions. And that's important to note. What he's dealing with here, in pagan religions, you had your gods and goddesses. But your gods and goddesses were powerless against the sisters of fate. Fate dictated how you would live your life, how you would, what you would do, and how your life would end. And so even the gods had no power over fate. What Paul is interesting saying is there is a plan that God has but it's not etched in stone for you. It's not about your fate. It's about the choices that you make. And that's an important lesson for us to understand as we talk about uh, Paul reaching out to the Gentiles. One of the things he has to do is break down this idea of fate. Because uh, uh, even, even in their religions, uh, fate was more powerful than gods or goddesses. Even the gods and goddesses uh, had their fate. Okay. But that's, uh, that's something else Paul is dealing with with the Gentiles. Uh, pleased to be, to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him amongst the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anybody in order that I might preach among the Gentiles. Now, you have to see the irony in this. Paul, who is Staunch Jew, staunch Pharisee, persecuting the church, imprisoning the people. He may even be putting his uh, seal of death upon them. Uh, uh, and what's their attitude toward Gentiles? They were lower than dogs. So here God is asking, or Jesus Christ is asking this Pharisee among Pharisees to go to the Gentiles. You have to see the irony in that and how Paul accepts that. And not only the zealousness about, the zealousness about being a Jew, now he's going to talk about being a zealous for the Gentiles. All right? Because I talked about there is this growing problem between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And I want to be very clear about this, that there were sincere Jewish Christians who accepted 
Gentile Christians. But their acceptance is different. And we're going to learn that when we get to Acts 15. There, Paul is going to address this problem. All right? How would he do with these new Gentile Christians? They were saved by the grace and faith of Jesus Christ, not about obedience to a law or to the traditions. And this is so key to us, we need to remember. Obedience does not save us. Obedience is part of our understanding the commands and doing the commands of God, but it does not save us. We are obedient because of our faith to Christ, not faith to a system, not faith to a group, not faith of that, but a faith to Jesus Christ. Obedience is an act that we do out of love for God. All right? Obedience means values, the values we put on the principle. And the principle is this. That God had called you through Jesus Christ and through faith in Jesus Christ, you are part of the family of God. All right? Gentiles. What does that mean? Again, we're in an area that has oral traditions. All right? And so there's this controversy brewing. What do we do? How do we bring them in? After all, Moses said, circumcise everybody. All right? Uh, uh, all his children. And we know from learning the book of Acts, that Timothy was circumcised. Titus was not. Titus is a Greek, Gentile. And even though they demanded him to be circumcised, Paul said no. And that's going to be very important. But for Timothy, that's a different story because he comes out of the Jewish traditions. And so in the book of Acts, what we're going to see is you Jewish Christians, you keep on doing what you're doing, but don't put that on the Gentile Christians. You can still you can keep your your moons or your Sabbath moons. You can still keep circumcision. You can still keep all that stuff. But also, you have been saved. That's why Romans says, "You have been saved as well by faith in Christ." But if you want to continue on with those things, that's fine. Don't put it on the Gentiles. And what's probably happening in Galatia, some Judaizers, what we call Judaizers, those who want to take the Gentile Christians and put them into their role. This is so important. Again, I talked about there's three types of salvation. Your present salvation being justified. Your present, I mean, your past salvation. Your present salvation, how you're working through your salvation in life. And your final salvation comes from when Jesus returns. These Judaizers would not, would not keep the Gentiles from being baptized. All right? They would not. It's not that they're attacking their baptism or their initial thoughts. They're attacking how you live your life, your present salvation. Okay? That's so important for us to understand is that their gospel that they're preaching is about changing your life now, how you live it, all right? Uh, and to the point where Christ is taken out of the picture, all right? <clears throat> Any questions or thoughts about that? Now, because we understand that, I don't want to see that we're justifying them, Judaizers, or that we're uh, uh, defending them or not. We're just understanding what's going on, okay? All right, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach among the Gentiles. I did not really consult with any, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. So there's a three-day uh, window here from the time he was converted to the time he finally goes to Jerusalem. What does that tell us about Paul? He's trying to say, listen, I've been preaching this for a long time. This comes from Christ. For three years I've been preaching this. All right. Verse 18. All right. uh, and went to visit Cephas, who was Paul, and remained with him 15 days. I remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles 
except James, the Lord's brother. Bingo, anybody who says there's only 12 apostles, how many do we have so far? 14. We got Paul and James, and soon we'll be introduced to another one. Who's the other one we're going to be introduced to? Begins with a B. Bar. Bar. It starts with how we put horses. Barna. Barna. Bo. All right? Okay. He saw none of the apostles except James the Lord, brother. And, and what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. When you see parentheses around something, what does that mean? It was something added. All right? Understand that when we get the, trans the Bible today, that comes out of thousands of pieces of manuscripts. There wasn't a whole Bible that was given to us from the first century. There are manuscripts. They come in pieces. And so they may piece together manuscripts. I know that the Gospel of John, I think there's only one complete Gospel of John. The rest all come from uh, uh, manuscripts. All right, so somewhere in a manuscript, either a scribe wrote this or somewhere in one of the other manuscripts, it said this, in what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. All right. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in the person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. Churches of Judea mean what? Territory of Judea, around Jerusalem. All right? And even though he's there, and even though he's meeting with Cephas, even though he's meeting with Paul, still people don't know who he is. They only were hearing it said, who he used to prosecute us is now preaching the faith we he once tried to destroy. Again, Paul's giving the emphasis that his gospel is true. All right, his gospel is true, even though others have, have thought about him less. So we get from this statement here also that those who are teaching in Galatia are, are denouncing Paul as an apostle. All right? So get it from this statement. Paul's trying to defend himself as an apostle. I went up because of a revelation and sent before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim amongst the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. All right? Uh, so he goes to Peter, he goes to James, uh, and others who are influenced in... By the way, who's James? James is who? The brother. Why is he head of the church? In Jerusalem. Because he's the oldest brother. And so that would fall upon him. All right. So he is an apostle not only by Jesus Christ, but he's also head of the church because of his kinship to Jesus. Being the older brother, that role falls onto him. Uh, much like a, a wife, who, a widow uh, with brothers. Uh, they, her, her care would then be transformed to, to the older brother. All right? So that's why James is an apostle. He's also the leader of the church. There are other elders of the church. We'll learn this in Acts 15. There are other elders in Jerusalem, uh, but James is the head of it. All right. He wanted to make sure that he was not preaching a gospel contrary to what the apostles were preaching. And that's important why. Again, he's defending himself. He's defending what he has taught. This is true. And I am not teaching something different. All right? And this is key, verse 3. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. So now again, we're getting another indication of who these false teachers are. Yet because of false brothers, secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. Or oh, is a conspiracy going on here? Paul wants them to understand this is not some willy-dilly stuff going on. 
there's a conspiracy here. When I, how many of you have heard of the Boston Movement? How many here have heard of the Boston Movement and what that was? All right. All right, so the Boston Movement, what they would do was find churches that did not have elders, that had, were governed by men's meetings. And they infiltrated that by sending their members in to become part of that church. Once part of that church, they were then part of the uh, organization and leadership. And they began to slowly turn the churches away. That was the conflict that was going on in the Northeast back when, in the 80s and 90s when I was back there. So the same kind of conspiracies. Now, I know that the Boston movement has changed a lot. Uh, it's no longer that way. Uh, uh, so, but I, I want us to understand that's exactly what's going on here. They're being infiltrated by these, Jude, what we call the Judaizers. Paul calls them false brothers, secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ so they might bring us back into slavery. Now, does that tell you the consequences of what they're teaching? They're teaching some consequences here. They're teaching you that you're no longer free by the grace of God. You have to obey the laws of Moses in order to live your life. And what that means is they are taking you out of God's grace, God's love, God's care, and putting you under the bondage of the law. All right. Uh, verse, we're in chapter 2, by the way, 5, five beginning in 6. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. What they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. There was nothing more they added to Paul's preaching, nothing more to added to Paul's preaching or teaching. All right? On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had entrusted with the gospel to the, uncircum to the circumcised, for he who works through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised works also through me for mine to the Gentiles. All right? So he announces that even though Peter had been entrusted with those who had been circumcised, those of the Jews, Paul had been entrusted with the Gentiles. Now, he's going to defend the Gentiles throughout the book of Acts. All right? And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they be circumcised. I'm sorry. That we should go to the Gentiles and they to be circumcised. Oh, and they to the circumcised. Okay, I put the word be in there. I'm sorry, it's not. That they and they to the circumcised. So Paul is not only being a, an apostle to the Gentiles, he's going to also be a Gentile, I mean, an apostle to the circumcised that he's going to meet there. That's why Paul always starts in a synagogue, all right? And then he preaches in the synagogue, and then he goes out. Why does he start in the synagogue? Why does Paul, when Paul's a shipwreck on that island, he does not start a church. He's there for 18 months. He does not start a church, probably because we think, just we think, did not know that there was no synagogue there. Right? There has to be a foundation to the faith. And so what he's saying is that the circumcised has a foundation that's important to us. All right? But it's not all-encompassing. There's a moral lesson that can be learned from the circumcised that has to come over to the Gentiles. We know this from 1 Corinthians, because 1 Corinthians is total, Corinthians is totally a Gentile church. And Paul has to deal with many uh, moral issues. All right. 
Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So the principle is here, what? That he should go to the Gentiles and to the circumcised, right? That's the principle. What's the value they place on that? Remember the poor. This is so important to us that we remember the poor. Not just poor in money. What signified the poor in the first century? Status. They were powerless. They had no power whatsoever. In fact, in many circles, they were considered sinners. All right? Because they were poor. Uh, and so... Uh, remember, the poor didn't just mean feed them or give them clothing. It meant to give them the gospel as well. All right. But what's, what do we do when we hear the word but? A change coming. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Condemned of what, Cephas? Here we go. Now we know what the principle is. What's the value? For then certain men came from James. He was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Now, that does not mean they come from James, that James was preaching this. All right? These are disciples from James. That just means followers of James. That doesn't mean they had, James was behind this. All right? He's just initiating that these are coming out of something. All right? He was eating with, but when he drew back and said to himself, fearing the circumcised party. That's something we do, don't we? Let's just not leave that to Peter. Sometimes we will do that. Sometimes we'll allow culture or movements within the church to move us to change. And if we're not true to ourselves, that can be very dangerous. I know as a preacher I had, and a teacher, I had to be very careful uh, about what people' thoughts were, about their comments, but I had to also be faithful to who I was and my task. And it's very hard when you have someone over you saying, if you don't say this, you're going to get fired. And I'll tell you, there are a lot of preachers who are in that situation. People demanding, people, people saying that to me, you are our employee. And if you don't toe the line, uh, you will no longer be our employee. All right? And we need to be very careful about how we uh, encourage our preachers and teachers. Encourage them to be faithful to who they are and what they are. Okay? Uh, and that's exactly what's going on here. Peter and the others have, they saw these guys coming in, and they understood that what's going on, the problem. Peter's going to face this in chapter 10, by the way. Uh, and so because of that, uh, they separated themselves from the Gentiles. All right? Paul jumps right into his face. This is how zealous Paul is. This is how Paul, zealous Paul is for this principle that he's been given to the gospel. Uh, let's see, fear and just, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically among, along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by the hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct, I was not in step with the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas before them all, wow, he doesn't take him aside. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like the Jews? He, he defends the Gentiles. But he's not just defending the Gentiles. He's defending the gospel of faith in Jesus Christ. And I think we need to understand that. He is not uh, focused strictly on being Gentiles, but he's on that grace of God through Jesus Christ. That's what he's after. Either these are full-fledged members of the family of God, or they're not. And if they are, you need to treat them as such. Now, we know that's a problem in Corinth, because Peter will, I mean, Paul will address that very same problem in Corinth. 
The rich were doing this to the poor. Men were doing this to the females. And Paul had to address those issues and say, no, these are all members of the family of God, and you need to treat them as such. And he will get very indignant in the book of the Romans, and he will tell them, who are you to stand judgment over servants of God? And so he is very zealous about this. And I want to really plant that at your feet. You are all members of the family of God. Don't let anybody tell you any different. Don't let anybody tell you or treat you any differently. You are loved by God. You have been saved by the grace of God. You've been added to this family by the grace of God. And God is going to sustain you in this family by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. We need to remember that. We are just not members of a church. I don't like the word church. It's too impersonal. It's a building. It's a place where we worship. It's a group. No, we are a people of God. I prefer a family of God because that is personal. That's a personal relationship we have. Oh, I forgot I'm being taped by this, so I'll get some comments about this. But anyways, understand, that's important to understand that we are, regardless of who we are, regardless how old we are, regardless how young we are in Christ, we are a family of God. Uh, live like Jews. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. Justified meaning past salvation. You were not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Again, if Paul is using his own personal experience, yes, you're going to find that when you talk about values, there are even going to be excuse me, apostles who are going to be caught up in this. All right? That goes back to saying what? What Paul said earlier. If one of us, meaning apostles, or an angel comes to you with a different gospel, let them be accursed. So he's saying that even though you have, we have this principle of the grace of God, it can be affected even by the apostles. Right? Even by the apostles. Right? Um, but if our endeavor to be just, uh, justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For I rebuild what I had torn down. I prove myself to be a transgressor. Though through the law, I died to the law so that I might live in God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Such an important statement. And his own personal experience, he himself did not fall back into Judaism. He himself did not fall back on that. Now, we'll find out in the book of Acts toward the end that he actually goes into Jerusalem. And when he goes there, he does some Jewish traditional things because he was asked to do them. Uh, uh, but he does still uh, do some of these Jewish acts. He goes to the synagogues. He's part of their worship. All right? But he stays true to the idea of whether Jew or Gentile, all saved by the faith. Uh, and uh, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Personal example is meant to the Galatians. If I didn't do this, that means that you shouldn't do this. If anybody has the ability to fall back into Judaism, that's me. And I did not. All right. uh, I'll just finish the time. So I'll just finish up with verse 1 in chapter 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? 
It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you read this to receive the spirit of works of the law or by hearing with faith? Such an important question. Such an important question. That's even true today. Values, principles, values. The principle is that Jesus was our sacrifice for forgiveness of our sins. It is through faith in Christ that we are set apart. It is faith in Christ that makes us chosen. It is faith in Christ that makes us part of the family of God. It is faith in Christ upon which I now live my life. Okay? It is out of that love. What we have is a window to Paul's writings. So when Paul writes, he writes from personal experiences. He doesn't just put his head in the hat and write these things. Okay? All right, we'll end there because... Uh, time has come, and I can get caught up a lot. So there is no time to ask questions or make a last comment, even though we all like to do so. So I will ask anyways. Any last questions or thoughts? So in the words of Porky the Pig, that's all, folks. All right. JB, you want to close us in a word of prayer and give a thanks for the meal? Sure. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we've had together to fellowship and learn another part of your word and we just pray that we uh, have an open mind and heart that uh, we take these things and make our lives better and that we might be a better example to others. Father, we ask you to be with those of you in uh, responsible positions of responsibility in the country and, and may they consult your word for guidance before making any decisions. Father, now we thank you for this food we're about to receive and ask your blessing on those that prepare it. Thank you most of all for Christ who gave his life for us. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, next week we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3.